All right, today we're going to take a look at the polar form of complex numbers. And as usual, we'll outline it like this. We'll take a look at properties of complex numbers. We'll do a little bit of review. We'll introduce the concept of magnitude, which is kind of like saying the length of a number, which we'll sort of talk about as a vector, which we haven't seen yet either, but we'll sort of introduce some things as we go. And then we'll talk about what we can do with that, converting to polar form and operations with polar form. And we may uh, or may not dive too much into the nth roots of complex numbers, but there is some of material on that on the course site as well. So first things first, we have to, if we're going to talk about complex numbers, we better talk about I, the so-called imaginary unit. I exists as, or is defined to be, I is equal to the square root of negative one, an unanswerable problem. What times what gives you negative one? Well, I does. In other words, I answers the question blank times blank, the same thing squared gives you negative one. Well, we know nothing in the real number, uh, the world of real numbers works like that because positive times positive, if it's the same in both of these blanks, positive times positive gives you positive and negative times negative gives you negative. So nothing works. But we, if we let the number i be defined to be that number that when squared gives you negative one, that's what i does. And so really, if you can remember that fact and these two things, the rest of these come from those two pieces of inform information. Real quickly, i to the third is i times i times i. Well, that's i squared times i. Well, i squared is negative one times i, which is negative i, and so forth. I, I really encourage you to pause and, and, and think for yourself as to why it makes sense that i to the fourth is equal to one. Now, from here on out, we are gonna use complex numbers, and instead of x or y, we're gonna use the notation of z for them. Um, the number z is a complex number. And so Z is a complex number. A is what we're gonna call the real part, since there is no imaginary number attached to it. And B is what we're gonna call the imaginary part. The imaginary part of the number. Now, the conjugate, um, we've seen this introduced as x plus 5 has conjugate x minus 5 in the past. We're really playing the same game here with complex numbers. It's you leave the real part a positive and whatever number, whatever sign was in the middle, in this case b was positive, uh, now b becomes negative. If b is negative, then b becomes positive for the conjugate. So the notation for the conjugate of a complex complex number, complex number is Z with a bar over the top of it. Oops. All right. So we can plot complex numbers. We just have to change how we think about things. Um, and we make the X axis stand for the real part of the number and the Y axis stand, instead of being X and Y, we make the real part of the complex number and the imaginary part of the complex number. So if Z equals A plus, B i, then you go out a in the real direction because a is the real part of the number and b is the complex or the imaginary part and so b in the vertical direction. So we'll do a quick example here. We will plot um, one plus five i. Here, the horizontal axis is the real part. It's often denoted with RE for real part. And the vertical axis is the imaginary part. And so we've got, I see one and five. And so I'll just go five in each direction. We're counting by ones here. And so the real part is one, the imaginary part is five. So over one in the real direction and up five in the imaginary number direction. And this point in this plane is Z is equal to one plus five I. All right, next slide. Now it's time to introduce the magnitude of a complex number. It's also called the absolute value of a complex number and that's what our text does, but you'll see it called magnitude and, and magnitude is the terminology you'll see in future maths. Um, it'll become far more present. So there may not be a homework exercise on this concept, but you're still responsible for it. That's with respect to spring or uh, fall of 2021, if that's what year it is. So magnitude can be thought of as length. It's an okay way to think about it. And really what it represents is the distance to the origin or since we're talking about polar um, 
well, they, yeah, no. The distance to the origin or pole, since we talked about polar the other day. Now, our text uses a single pair of vertical bars around Z, um, our, our complex number Z. And since Z is the same thing as, as a X plus Y, by putting that absolute value around the outside, you're referring to the magnitude or length of that overall number. It's very common in future maths, however, to denote magnitude as double vertical bars. So I kind of like to introduce that concept here. Uh, since we're talking about distance to the origin, how are we going to figure that out? Well, it's good old Pythag to the rescue, right? Um, since it's distance to the origin, it's really just going to be yet another right triangle. So magnitude as length, if we draw a generic picture of some um, complex number, we'll put the z is equal to x plus y i and x what would be the x-axis is the real axis and what would be the y-axis is the imaginary axis so we'll in the x direction or i'm sorry in the real direction we go x units and in the imaginary direction we go y units well the distance here is represented by the hypotenuse and so we'll put double bars around z there to represent that distance and hey this is just yet another right triangle here that has horizontal distance x and vertical distance y. And so we've got a nice formula. x squared plus y squared, leg squared plus y squared equals hypotenuse squared equals the absolute value or the, the magnitude of z squared there. And that's how you come up with it. So the actual formula, if you look at the formula, the magnitude of z, absolute value, or double bar magnitude of z, if you prefer, is really just the square root of x squared plus y squared, which is really just Pythagoras, uh, the Pythagorean theorem in disguise. So let's do an example of calculating the magnitude for that number, or that plot that we did in the last example. We'll plot it again real quick. One in the real direction and five in the imaginary direction. One, two, three, four, five. It's kind of hard to see here because it's a small triangle, but there we go. Well, the base has length one, the vertical side has length five. And so the magnitude of Z there, absolute value is gonna be one squared plus five squared is equal to the hypotenuse squared. Well, the hypotenuse we're gonna represent with this fancy new notation for magnitude of Z. And that tells us that magnitude of Z is equal to the square root of one squared plus five squared is 26. And if we uh, wanted to approximate that with the decimal, that'd be 5.099-ish. And sure, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, it's really gonna mean that hypotenuse is not gonna be that much longer than that vertical side if you sit and think about it and take a look at the picture. All right, so next things next, we're gonna talk about complex numbers in polar coordinates. Well. To review, we should review polar coordinates real quick. We know that x is equal to r cosine of theta and y is equal to r sine of theta. And we have that nice relationship for the radius squared is equal to x squared plus y squared, which if you square root both sides leads you to r is equal to x squared plus y squared. And we just saw that, hey, r is, is uh, you know, magnitude of z if we're talking complex numbers. So there's, there's a parallel there. And so let's try and derive polar form of complex numbers. So once again, we'll kind of just draw a generic little picture here. We've got our real direction and our imaginary direction, and we've got a point up here, which z is equal to x plus yi. And we'll draw the triangle associated with this. Well, we know that, hey, if we're working in polar coordinates here, x is gonna be r cosine of theta. So this base is x equals r cosine of theta. And this vertical side is y is equal to r sine of theta. And so if we straight up just go ahead and replace those in our number, x and y, with r cosine of theta and r sine of theta, respectively, we have r cosine of theta in for x plus r sine of theta in for y, followed by i. You can then factor out an r and get that z is equal to r times cosine of theta plus, I like to stick the i in front of the trig function, i sine of theta. That way it doesn't accidentally slip into the input as like sine of i theta, because that's not what we want. It's i times sine of theta, right? Okay. So there's polar form 
of a complex number. Not that much different than what we've been doing. Okay, so a little bit of vocabulary here. For a complex number written in polar form, the modulus is referred to as r is equal to the magnitude or absolute value of z. And the argument theta, the input angle, is called and referred to as the argument. I think that modulus is not in our OpenStax text, but that's OK. All right, so let's do an example here. Given x equal or z is equal to x plus yi, where we want to convert it into polar form. So to do that, we could use um, what we know about the length of z, the magnitude of z, being the same thing as our r in polar coordinates to use the Pythagorean theorem to find that. And then we need to find the argument theta, which will probably involve a little bit of trigonometry. So let's just follow our nose through this and see what we can find. First things first, uh, to find r, we're going to identify the things that we know. Well, this z is the same thing as x plus yi. And so that tells us that x is negative 4 and y is positive 4. Now, if we wanted to convert just this part into polar coordinates, we'd say, well, x is r cosine of theta. So we'll replace x with r cosine of theta and y with r sine of theta. And once we do that, we have got, oh, oh sorry, r, when we replace y with r sine of theta, we got y equals 4. So r sine of theta equals 4. So now we need to find r. Does that, did that actually help us? Not really, but we do have a pretty nice way to find r. Well, it was in the instructions, right? So to find r, we're gonna say, all right, r is equal to square root of negative four squared plugging in x plus positive four squared. That value ends up giving us square root of 32, which is two. Um, I'm sorry, that's not two, it's two times two. That's two sets of two and another two sets of two times one lonely left over two. So r is equal to four root two as the exact reduced and simplest form of root 32. So now I've given ourselves another slide for this and now it's time. We found r, we better try and find theta. So let's uh, let's jump forward to this next slide so we have a bit more room and try and find theta. But to find theta, here's where we're going to actually start with, sorry about that, here's where we're going to start with r is and x is negative 4. So r cosine of theta equals negative 4 and r sine of theta equals positive 4. Why would we start with these? Well, because we're trying to find theta and theta is part of these expressions. Now, what could we do? What do we know so far? Well, the, the first thing we found, and so let's use that thing we found, we know that r is equal to 4 square root of 2. So let's substitute that in. That'll give us 4 root 2 cosine of theta equals negative 4. And 4 root 2 sine of theta equals positive 4. Now we've got some trig equations that we can work with. Um, dividing both sides by 4 root 2 respectively gives us cosine of theta equals to negative 4 over 4 root 2. Simplifying that gives us cosine of theta is equal to negative 1 over root 2. And we've seen this where if you rationalize the denominator, you get negative square root of 2 over 2 is the same thing as negative one over root two. If you do the same game with sine, dot, 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 you end up with sine of theta is equal to positive root two over two. Well, what angle do we know that works and has um, for both sine and theta, when we evaluate sine, I'm sorry, sine and cosine at the same angle, you get something to the tune of the same output, root two over two we know that theta is equal to pi over four ish. And if that doesn't pop off the top of your head, take a moment to write out that chart that we know. Zero, one half, root two over two. Oh man, pi over four, pi over four for both sine and cosine shows up there. All right, 
All right, so what do we know so far? Well, I actually, like when I first started teaching this, I, I did this complicated thing where I said, okay, what do you know? You know, you know that cosine is negative. Where do you have cosine negative? Well, for the cosine being negative, you have cosine negative on the left-hand side and cosine is positive on the right-hand side. So our value cannot be over there. Now for sine, what do you know about sine? Well, we know that sine above the axis is y, uh, above the axis is positive, and then sine below the x-axis is negative. So since sine is positive above, we know that it can't be down there. You put these two pieces of information together, and the only possible quadrant that this point can be in is in Q2. But we already know that. How do we already know that? Well, we've already plotted this point, or we could. We already know this by saying z is equal to negative 4 plus 4i. So the real part is the x-axis. So we're going to go negative 4 in the x direction. We're going to go positive 4 in the y direction. And our point's going to be over here in Q2. We already know that. So yes, the trigonometry will tell us that. But it's also nice to confirm with what we already know as well. So what are we actually trying to find? We're trying to find theta. And so we know that theta is equal to pi over four-ish. And then we know that theta, I'm sorry, theta is in the second quadrant. So what flavor of pi over four is in the second quadrant? Pi over four, pi over two, three pi over four. So we know now that theta is equal to three pi over four, and we're ready to put it all together. We now know that z is equal to x plus y i in polar form is r factored out times cosine of theta plus sine of theta i. We're going to replace in r with 4 root 2 and then cosine of 3 pi over 4 plus sine of 3 pi over 4 i. And if you do that math, you get 4 root 2 times negative root 2 over 2 plus positive root 2 over 2 i. And you can distribute that through and simplify as you want, but it's nice to keep them separate as two things like that as well, because you may be asked to answer your answers in format similar to that on homework questions or an exam. All right, so that's uh, converting a complex number to polar. You first find the radius and then you find theta using standard trick stuff we've done before. So let's do another example. This time we have z is equal to four. A Little bit faster this time. Z is equal to four. Well, well, I need to think of this as z is equal to x plus y i. How do you write four? You wrote four as four plus zero i. And so you know that x is equal to four, y is equal to zero, and so your first things we'll do is we'll find our radius and our r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. So we'll have 4 squared plus 0 squared is equal to 4. So r is equal to 4. Now for theta, we know that x is r cosine of theta is equal to 4. And y is r sine of theta is equal to 0. So what can we do here? Solving for, well, replacing r with 4, we have 4 cosine of theta is equal to 4. That leads us to cosine of theta equals to 1. And then 4 sine of theta equals to 0 gives us still that sine of theta is equal to 0. You put all this information together. And well, before we go further, we say, all right, let's plot this um, z plotted it's got no imaginary and positive four in there. All right, so we're right on the x-axis. So what theta angle gives us one for cosine and zero for sine? Theta is equal to um, zero. So to convert this thing to polar coordinates or polar format, we know r and we know theta, and we can write z is equal to r times cosine of theta plus uh, sine of theta i. And even though I said I don't like to do it, I still wrote my i afterwards. That's OK, as long as you don't let it slip inside. And so replacing these, we get z is equal to r is known to be 4 and cosine of 0. 
because theta is zero and sine of zero i. And you can simplify that out and it will actually end up just being the same. All right, another one. All right, so here we have four i, so that's zero plus four i to give us x is equal to zero and y is equal to four. To find my radius, r is gonna be very similar to the last problem we did. Uh, zero squared plus four uh, squared equals to four, so the radius is equal to four. To find theta, we have x equals zero leads us to cosine of theta equals zero and sine r sine of theta equals to four rather now. And then r we know to be four, so four cosine of theta equals zero, four sine of theta equals four. Solving these gives us cosine of theta still zero and sine of theta is equal to one. Plotting this thing to see what quadrant we're in, we see that we have four in the uh, imaginary direction. So we're on the vertical y-axis, if you will. And what theta value gives us zero for cosine and, and one for sine there? Theta is equal to pi over two, right on that y-axis will work. And so to convert this thing into polar coordinates, a polar form of our complex number, we have r times cosine of theta plus sine of theta, and i, I'll stick the i in front of it, and this time r is four and cosine of pi over two plus i sine of pi over two. And we've closed up a parenthesis and we've done it. We could do another little bit harder one here. This time x is equal to seven and y is equal to 210. R as always is just an application of the Pythagorean theorem. X squared is seven squared plus Y squared is 10 squared. That gives you that we're going to have the square root of 149 for my radius. For theta, we're going to have, um, to find theta rather, we're going to have uh, R cosine of theta for X is equal to seven and R sine of theta is equal to 10 for y equals 10. We're gonna substitute r in for 149 square root of cosine of theta equals to seven and square root of 149 sine of theta is equal to 10. Solving both of these gives us cosine of theta equals to seven over square root of 149 sine of theta equals 10 over square root of 149. And what do we got here? Well, here's where uh, once again, by plotting this, you know that you go seven in the real direction, 10 in the imaginary direction, we're in quadrant one. That's gonna help us down here when we're hunting for theta because we can use inverse trig. Theta is equal to inverse cosine of seven over the square root of 149. You can also do the same thing over there. Theta is equal to inverse sine of 10 over square root of 149. It'll give you the same value and I encourage you to check that. And no matter what, since cosine, well, this will return theta less than or equal to pi, less than or equal to zero for cosine. And this for sine inverse, it'll return theta between pi over two and negative pi over two. Well, the only overlap there is quadrant one anyway, but you still need to take and check and account for what quadrant your point is if you're gonna use inverse trig and make sure you're not giving the inverse trig answer if it's in a different quadrant but you're relating that angle to the appropriate quadrant. All right, so the last thing we can do here is we can work with and do operations with polar um, form of complex numbers. And this is, I'm just gonna present this and that's what we're gonna do for this, uh, the extent of as far as I wanna get into this stuff. It's basically just working with polar, uh, polar form of complex numbers, working with complex numbers in polar form. Uh, and the general just notation we're gonna agree upon is that if we just give you Z, it's gonna be R equals cosine theta, I sine of theta. If I give you Z1 and Z2, it's gonna be R1 and theta one and R2 and theta two respectively. And I'm noticing that in my notes, I don't have closing parentheses on either of those. It, it should since the closure, closing parentheses are currently the inputs there. So here are the formulas for multiplication z1 times z2. You multiply the radiuses, and then within the argument, within the trig functions, you add the arguments. 
If you're dividing, you divide the radiuses, and then within the trig functions, you subtract the arguments instead. Now, one other thing we can do is we can take the power of a, a complex number in polar form. So z to the nth power is equal to the radius to the nth power. And then within the argument of the trig functions, you multiply it the angle by n. This is sometimes abbreviated as uh, z to the n equals r to the n cis n of theta. So what may you need to do? In order to do this, you might have to convert your number to polar form if it's given you in uh, rectangular form, x plus i, y, i, and then apply the formula. To find the nth root of a complex number, you can apply the formula above using n is equal to 1 over m. And this is called de Moivre's theorem. All right, so again, assume all examples are in this format unless otherwise agreed upon and stated. So a couple more examples, and we're nearing done with this one. So this thing is in x plus i, y format. And they tell us that because it says to find polar form of that. Well, so this is really just the same process we've done before. So r is equal to applying the Pythagorean theorem, 1 squared for x plus the square root of 3, quantity squared. Well, that's going to give us 1 plus 3 is equal to 4. Square root of that is just 2. So our radius for this example is 2. And now for x equals to 1, is going to give us x equals to 1 is going to give us our cosine of theta equals to 1. But we know that r is 2, so we may as well fill that in right now, because that's what we've been doing y is equal to the square root of 3, but not just any square root of 3, the negative square root of 3. Technically, I probably should have had a negative over here. Since you're squaring a negative number, it becomes positive. It didn't end up mattering, but I really should have. Our cosine of theta is equal to negative square root of 3 gives us 2 sine of theta equals negative root 3. Solving for cosine and sine independently, we have cosine of theta is equal to 1 over 2, and sine of theta is equal to negative root 3 over 2. Now, we're far enough along in our trig studies to know that this is a relatively one that we are capable of doing, finding the angle that goes with this, because those are key angle outputs. But we'll just plot this guy to help us out and figure out what quadrant we're living in. So we go 1 in the positive x direction, and then negative root 3 in the, in the imaginary direction. And so it looks like we're going to be down here in quadrant four, which will help us out here. So what angle gives cosine of one half and sine of root three over two and lives in quadrant four? That's going to be theta equals five pi over three. So now we're, we're told that we were supposed to convert this thing into polar form using zero or a theta between zero and pi over two. Well, conveniently, this theta meets that. And so what do we know? In order to convert polar form, we know r is equal to two and theta equals five pi over three. And so we have done it. z is equal to two times cosine of five pi over three plus i sine of 5 pi over 3. And we've converted our number into polar form. What do we want to do with that? Well, wait a minute. I overlooked some major thing here. There was a fifth power on there that I just completely ignored. And that, that wasn't actually by accident. It turns out to work with this and apply this thing, the first thing you need to do is write z itself as this. And so really, I was treating this problem as if it was z to the fifth over here. And I need to figure out what z to the fifth is. So I converted the underlying z, the underlying complex number, into polar form. And now on this second page, we will deal with pretending now saying, hey, now that I know that z is equal to 2 times cosine of 5 pi over 3 um, plus i sine of 5 pi over 3. Now I'm ready to say, OK, well, what is z to the fifth? Well, our formula is z to the fifth is equal to radius to the fifth power 
times cosine of five theta plus I sine of five theta. So we'll substitute that and I know the radius is two, so two to the fifth. And then cosine of five theta is five times five pi over three plus I sine of five times five pi over three gives us our answer that z to the fifth power is equal to 32 times cosine of 25 pi over three plus i sine of 25 pi over three. The reason I did it this way and kind of ignored this little fifth until the end and then said, hey, treat it as if um, the number z is the stuff in the parentheses and convert that into polar first and then worry about applying the formulas because sometimes homework questions are asked this way and it, it's helpful to do it that way to say hey all right first I'm going to convert the underlying thing I'm given into uh, into polar form and then I'm going to worry about applying the formula now have we met the criteria though have we actually oh no I'm supposed to give z to the fifth but I'm supposed to use theta this input uh, between zero and two pi. Well, 25 pi over three. All right, so you counted around a bunch of times and it turns out that 25 pi over three is the same thing as pi over three. And so to actually answer our question here, we would change these to pi over three since they are the same idea. All right, so now we're given another complex number here and we're asked to just do some do some uh, some math to it so I want to take five times z so the first thing we need to do is we need to think of five times z as well what are we doing we're multiplying two numbers so we're going to think of this as z1 times z2 where five is z1 and our original um, z is the second number so what's the formula for z1 times z2? Well, the formula for z1, z2 is r1, r2, and then you add the arguments, theta1 plus theta2 plus i sine theta1 plus theta2. So what's uh, the first thing to do is to identify all these pieces of the puzzle. Well, for my given z, this means r2 2, because we're thinking of this as z2, r2 is 7, theta2 2 is 2.2. 2. So now what remains to be seen is we have to figure out what, well, let me turn this to blue here. Let's make 5 into blue, r1 and theta1. So how do I write 5 as a complex number? Well, uh, in polar form. We're thinking of it as it's given as five, and you and I are used to thinking of five as the real number. So we're going to write this as five plus zero i. X is equal to five, y is equal to zero. And we'll go through the same process that we did before to convert this into polar form of our complex number. This is writing five as a complex number. And now we're going to convert that complex number into polar complex as five times cosine of zero plus i sine of zero. And this tells us that theta one is equal to zero and r one is equal to five. And this process of converting into the polar number is the same as we just did in the last examples. You find your radius and then you find your angle and you substitute them in. So, Let's put this all together. Five times Z is equal to R1, R2, parenthesis cosine of theta one plus theta two plus I sine of theta one plus theta two. Now we know all the pieces of the puzzle r1 is equal to 5, r2 is equal to 7, cosine of theta1 is equal to 0, plus theta2 is equal to 2.2, and we're dealing with radians here, plus i 
sine of theta one is zero plus 2.2. Simplifying that out, you get 35, that five Z is equal to 35 times cosine of 2.2 plus I sine of 2.2. Next example, given this number, which it looks like I don't have a closing parenthesis on, go ahead and find the conjugate of it. So in order to find the conjugate, well, we think about what the definition of the conjugate is. The only definition we have is uh, for Z, thinking of Z as X plus Y I, then Z bar is equal to X minus Y I. But the problem is we don't have our function or our complex number given to us in X plus Y I format, but rather we have it into polar format. And so what we do to convert back to rectangular complex, if you will, X and Y is just work with the trig. Z is equal to seven times Cosine of 2.2 gives us negative 0 0.59. And again, we're working with radians. Plus I times sine of 2.2. Sine of 2.2 gives us 0 0.81. And then multiplying that through by 7 gives us negative 4.1195 plus 5.6595I. And here we have, we've converted Z now is equal to a number, a real number, plus another real number, y, times i. So to find z conjugate, we leave the first number alone, because remember, z conjugate is x minus yi, so the sign only changes on the second guy. 4.1195, well, since 5.6595 is positive, it changes to negative, but minus 5.6595i, and there's your conjugate for this thing. That's good, but what if we ask for this in terms of polar version of our, our uh, polar version of our complex number? So, graph this thing in terms of x and y. So z, z is this, negative four in the x direction, positive five-ish in the y direction. So here we go, we have a z. And then now looking at the conjugate, you have negative four in the x direction and negative five in the imaginary direction. So you have z bar down here. Now, what do we know so far? We know that r is equal to seven. So we know that this is seven and that is distance seven. So we're pretty happy with r. And we know also that theta is equal to 2.2 for z. Theta equals 2.2. Remember, pi is 3.14-ish. So that's the end. Pi over two is 1.57. So 2.2-ish seems reasonable there. And so the big question we have is, what is the angle that works for the conjugate? Well, so the easiest way to think of this is that, I think anyway, is that this is 2.2. It's in the negative direction though. And so this red angle, you could think of it as two pi, um, the theta for, for z conjugate, theta for z conjugate is equal to two pi minus 2.2. And if you calculate that out, you end up with something to the tune of 4.08 radians. And so my conjugate can be written as same radius, same magnitude, same distance, but the angle I need to travel, cosine is 4.08 plus I sine of 4.08 instead of going 2.2, because that'll get us there. 
to the same, the conjugate location. Last but not least here, we're gonna do a division example. And so once again, we have to take things and think, okay, well, one is not really a complex number. To write it as a complex number, we're gonna think of it as um, x plus y i. And to write one in that format, you have zero plus, I mean, one plus zero i over z. And so like writing that out and saying, okay, well, we better convert this into polar as well. So Z is in polar form. So I better have one in polar form and one in polar form is one times cosine of zero plus I sine of zero. And then polar Z is seven times cosine of 2.2 plus I sine of 2.2. And now we're really just gonna apply the formula and the formula for, for z1 over z2 is equal to r1 over r2 times cosine of subtract the arguments theta top so r1 minus theta 2 theta bottom plus i sine of theta top theta 1 minus theta 2 what you got here is fill in some blanks r1 is r1 is 1 r2 is 7 cosine of Theta one is zero, so zero minus theta two is 2.2 .2 plus i sine of, again, theta one is zero and theta two is 2.2, .2, so zero minus 2.2. .2. Simplify that down a little bit. We get one over z is equal to one seventh times cosine of negative 2.2 .2 plus i sine of negative 2.2, .2, which is a perfectly good answer. But if we're asked to restrict our answer between theta less than zero and two pi between zero and two pi like we saw oftentimes are like we saw in the last example negative 2.2 .2 radians is the same thing as uh, 4.08 and we've done it we've calculated one over z in polar form and that is as far as we are going to go into complex numbers in polar form